Thank you, Melanie. Thank you, everyone, for being here today. Uh, please feel free to get coffee or whatnot as you get your seats. Uh, my name is Dave Shear. I'm the scholarly repository specialist in the Purdue University Libraries. And I'm here to talk to you today about a continuum of publishing opportunities, uh, our Purdue University Libraries Publishing Division. And I'm representing both myself as my, and my counterpart also in the University Press, Catherine Purple, who is the managing editor and no longer the co-interim director. Uh, so we've just recently hired uh, Peter Froelich from IU Press to be the new director of the publishing division, head of Purdue University Press, and head of Scully Publishing Services. And we're looking forward to have Peter uh, starting with us in May. So very quickly, I'm going to be talking to you about the evolution of our division. Uh, in March of 2012, a strategic collaboration began, and today is being properly rolled out as a new division of the libraries. The Purdue University Libraries Publishing Division creates a collaboration and environment by uniting the Purdue University Press and Scholarly Publishing Services. So the publishing division is dedicated to enhancing the impact and extending the reach of academic research and scholarship across a spectrum of scholarly outputs. Uh, this may include uh, innovative electronic products such as technical reports, conference proceedings, uh, and in, in collaboration with fellow information professionals in the libraries across the university, we provide targeted services to support Purdue faculty, staff, and students at all stages of the scholarly communication process. So really briefly, I'll give an overview of our two units. Uh, the Purdue University Press was founded in 1960 and publishes peer-reviewed books and journals. Its publishing program is directed by an ed editorial board of nine faculty members. Uh, the press publishes work by scholars around the world and Purdue faculty in disciplinary fields that are aligned with the mission and emphasis of the university. We aim to print about 25 new books each year. Uh, here you'll see four covers actually of over the 450 titles offered by the press uh, which includes 17 active book series, three print journals, and seven open access journals across 14 signature areas for the press. So Scholarly Publishing Services predominantly disseminates a wide range of academic materials, including, as I've already mentioned, technical report series, conference proceedings, uh, and open access journals. Scholarly Publishing Services was developed out of Purdue EPUBs, which is our open access institutional repository built on the Digital Commons platform by B Press. Um, this is distinct in the fact that all projects published uh, through SBS are affiliated with the faculty and staff and students of the university and are vetted on different levels of review uh, based on the individual project. We need to make a distinction between SBS and Purdue EPUBs that all products are published by SBS are open access and available through Purdue EPUBs. However, not all items or series uh, or proceeding collections are available through the SBS brand. Uh, SBS has over 11 open access journals, six conference proceedings, nine open access books, and thousands of technical reports that we have available. So now I'm going to talk to you about the press and SBS collaboration. Uh, so this is a model where we were able to develop a pricing guide to offer SBS products that would allow us to provide uh, additional publishing services outside of just our institutional repository. And these additional services are in collaboration with our press, where we're actually using our press uh, as a vendor for these services. Or if not the press directly, we're working with the press to use the relationship and experience they have in this area to have the relationship with their vendors. So what you see here is a breakdown of the services that we offer to an organization, say a conference that's being held at Purdue, uh, whether it be editorial services, production and printing services, or shipping, and then making sure that we do point out the free services that are at the base layer of using uh, the Purdue EPUBs repository to provide the hosting and open access dissemination services. Between these two different uh, camps, we also have something that allows us to provide a management of what's going on and providing a much more direct service to the groups that we're working with. And we produce this through our project management fee, which is about 20 to 25 percent of the overall project. 
So what are the benefits of the collaboration? Well, first we'll point out the benefits of working with the press from our perspective. First and foremost, we are able to benefit from their foundational knowledge. They've been publishing since I said in the 1960s, and there's roughly over 50 years of experience just within the, our small university press. So we're able to build off that foundational knowledge of being able to produce products, uh, working with authors, working with vendors, and overall just working off their experience in this area of, as, a, as a publisher. But additionally, in an area that we in the libraries, I think, don't value as highly is their ability to uh, market their materials and learning about how do we market uh, our services but also marketing our products. From the perspective of working with SPS, we have the ability to create innovative solutions um, and experimentation that the press may not be able to, to handle or through the relationship with their, their management board or editorial board uh, be able to, to do on an annual basis. By adding these opportunities to the repository though, uh, we're able then to also increase our dissemination and access of materials. So there's a way where with the items that we work with through their services, they get the exposure of the materials they wouldn't have otherwise been able to do just through their traditional means. With the products that we produce through SBS though, there's also the opportunity where these items can be seen as an acquisition source for the press as well, which allows us to grow our symbiotic relationship between the two units. What you're seeing here actually is uh, an upcoming monograph cover for a book that will be published here soon by our press uh, that is actually based upon a conference that was held at Purdue where the proceedings were published through Scully Publishing Services. But there are some challenges. Uh, first and foremost would be acceptance. And it's acceptance from both camps, both acceptance from other university presses for working with our university press and working with the libraries, but also acceptance for the libraries to be working with uh, the university press. It produces then a shift in culture, both internally and externally. Internally, we're trying to increase the acceptance of our publishing division versus the regular players in this area. So when a conference were to come to Purdue uh, and have their proceedings hosted, going to the traditional publishers for that hosting and publishing services versus turning to the libraries. Externally, though, it's acceptance of the products that we're providing and the service we're providing in being seen as um, a player in this space. But this is also our opportunities as well. So being able to provide what we do offer, we're able to then provide tailored solutions that are cost effective and uh, more easily able to be provided to the groups we work with at a more affordable rate. Because we're able to then tailor our services based on the experiences and capabilities of our press, there is some validity in what we're able to do. And at the same time, this provides the uniqueness of what we're doing. Overall, what we're trying to do is provide an opportunity where we're actually then seen as the publishing hub at Purdue. Uh, for a good example, there's a lot of different groups that are involved in publishing at Purdue, whether it be our printing services, uh, but also, more importantly, our conferences division, where anything that's held at Purdue has to go through for access to rooms, uh, access for registration capabilities, uh, but overall organization and management of a conference. And by working with this group, we can actually then be their own individual vendor to provide a publishing solution that they themselves wouldn't either be able to provide through their own services, or additionally being able to expand upon that after the conference has precluded. So where are we going? Uh, we're trying to increase this, this symbiotic relationship, the cohesion between our university press and our library publishing unit, and being seen as the publishing division here at Purdue through our campus stakeholders. In a lot of ways, as they start to learn more and more about our division, they're also able to learn more about uh, the two units, so being able to see uh, the trees while understanding the forest at the same time. Hopefully they're able to then validate what we're providing and continuing to see this as a unique opportunity that we can provide to our campus stakeholders. By doing so, hopefully we'll be able to solidify this hub perspective of the publishing division by building relationships, marketing our services and marketing our materials, expanding the usage of our materials, further engaging with our campus stakeholders, 
and overall serving the spectrum of scholarly communication needs at Purdue. So that's my brief period. I hope I was under. Uh, and I will now turn it over to the next presentation. Thank you. Hey, everybody. How's it going? Good, thanks. Look, I came from Buffalo to give you 15 minutes of good news, so give me some love here. Um, come on. Ah, okay, good. Trying to get the mouse to work here. There we go. Got it. Hooray. Um, so, 15 minutes. Whoops. We're here to talk about technology today. <clears throat> Thanks, buddy. Yeah. Yeah. Much appreciated. All right, so uh, 15 minutes is going to go real fast, and Bob and I have to split this up. So uh, my name is Chris Hollister, and I am um, co-founder and co-editor of the Open Access Journal, Communications and Information Literacy. I'm pleased to be joined today by my co-editor and co-presenter, Bob Schroeder, from right here in Portland. And uh, we should note that um, our other co-founder and co-editor, uh, Stu Brower, was unable to be here for the presentation today. Um, our lightning presentation is a case study about sustainable open access journal publishing. Um, what you're looking at is our most recently published issue, volume eight, number two. Um, volume nine, number one, is currently in production. You probably saw the celebration out here on the mall a few minutes ago. That was celebration of nearly 10 years of CIL. Um, so from the outset, uh, CIL to us was more than just sort of a cool thing to do. Uh, as we know, creating open access journals is um, almost a common sort of professional activity these days. But um, from the outset, um, the idea of sustainability was really the guiding force. And this goes all the way back to the initial planning stages back in um, late 2005. Um, and, and to us, sustainability is more than just the economic model. Um, in the context of CIL, um, sustainability refers to long-term impact and uh, philosophy of what a scholarly journal is um, and what it should be, particularly in the digital age and the economic realities. So for scholarly impact, uh, fairly early on, we carved out a useful niche for ourselves in terms of um, relevant and timely subject matter, information literacy. Um, and also, importantly, in terms of a gap in the professional literature. So if you think back, uh, that was about the time that the journal research strategies ceased publication. Uh, sustainable impact also means long-term relevance. And in order to address this, we uh, leveraged established voices in the field, but we also cultivated new ones in, in all areas of the journal. Um, so on the editorial board, in our pool of manuscript reviewers, and among our uh, family of contributing authors. Um, sustainable impact also refers to, obviously, distribution. We wanted to broadcast as widely as possible. Um, so we wanted to take full advantage of everything that the free web had to offer, and also the proprietary side. So as an example, directories, Right away, we got into the directory of open access journals and also into Ulrichs. Uh, for indexes, right away, we switched on our Google Scholar, and uh, we were very early on able to get into um, proprietary databases offered by EBSCO and ProQuest and later on um, Elsevier Science. 
So sustainable philosophy. Um, we are an open access journal in the real sense. None of this business about author fees or article processing fees. Uh, and as it follows, uh, we've heard this a lot today, but as it follows, we adopted the Creative Commons copyright licensing model where authors retain ownership of their own work. Go figure, right? Um, and our philosophy was that of raising the standard of the professional literature by modeling a sustainable alternative to the commercial publishing enterprise. We believe in open finances. If you go to our website, you will see every dollar that has come in all the way back to 2005 and every dollar that has gone out. Um, and um, our philosophy is environmental in nature as well. And so we are hosted on a carbon neutral web hosting service. Um, sustainable economics. Um, from the outset, we established ourselves as a not-for-profit corporation. Our financial needs have always been very modest. Our primary concern was always web hosting fees. Um, so right away, we adopted the PBS model, right? Plead, beg, steal, right? Um, we existed uh, early on off of donations. We experimented with print-on-demand services. Um, we were successful with some small uh, research grants. Um, and now we're doing pretty well with vendor royalties. So you see how um, this sort of marriage of the free web and the proprietary side has worked out pretty well for us. Um, in terms of sustainable economics, um, that relates to technology as well. So um, we've heard a lot about OJS today. We adopted OJS, and um, that was free, and it was adequate for our needs. And we may migrate at some point, but it still works for us. Uh, planning for, st uh, for sustainability required one and a half years of development before we launched our first issue. I cannot emphasize enough that all of that time was required in, in order for us to have a successful launch. Um, we also needed to have um, recognizable uh, names on the editorial board to give us that initial pulse of prestige and stability and attraction. Um, and uh, this is another very, very important um, element of how we got started and how it worked out. We established um, roles for ourselves in the journal. Each of us had very specific roles in terms of communications, finances, production, technology, and so on. And we also wanted to launch with sort of a big bang. And for us, that was uh, launching at the Willow Conference in 2007 in Toronto. Um, in terms of sustainable growth, um, our philosophy is that of slow and steady. Uh, Bob would call that organic or maybe crunchy, right? Um, but really, we believe uh, we are built on reputation and philosophy. And yes, of course, we've experienced some growing pains along the way. But as uh, Bob will share with you, uh, there's really been a lot of noteworthy and ongoing successes. Bob? Hello, I'm Bob Schroeder from Portland State. Um, I'm gonna talk a little bit about the expansion of the journal. Um, and I think it was organic, kind of granola. Um, and I think that's very important because when you recognize at a certain point um, within your own journal that you're growing, um, it's important to add additional board members, uh, reviewers. I was an author originally, and Chris invited me to become a reviewer. Um, and then I started um, reviewing. I became a co-editor in 2011. Um, it's strange what can happen on your sabbatical. Um, you think you have a lot of time on your hands, and oh yeah, I can become an editor of that journal. Um, so that's what I did. Um, <clears throat> currently, we're um, adding a book review section, so we have a book review editor. And we also have perspectives, um, which are more sort of timely essays rather than uh, peer-reviewed articles. So we're um, offering a perspective um, editors to sort of take that and run with it. Um, some of the successes that ACRL um, has given us are an instruction section award that was given to Kristen Stewart. It was a special certificate of recognition and achievement in 2009 um, for launching the journal. 
Um, and I think, if I think back, you know, 2009, it was kind of the beginning of the Wild West with open access. Um, we are moving up in the SJR, and I'm not sure how to pronounce this, the Simago Journal ranking. Um, in 2010, we were number 145, um, and in 2013, we were number 66. Um, currently, the journal citation reports is undergoing a review. Um, they need so many years of uh, data to collect in order to have you reviewed, and so we're looking forward to that um, to see if we can get in. Um, now, five nuggets of experience I'd like to share uh, just very quickly. Um, these are what I call the human factors of sustainability um, because I really think sustainability is economics, it's philosophy, but it does come down to that day-to-day how are we going to keep this journal going? So communication, um, it has to be constant and supportive. Um, these are all sort of interlocking um, five nuggets. Uh, teamwork, um, I do believe in dedication and doing what needs to be done. So I think there is, has been a lot of cross training as we've been going along, even though people have primary duties. Um, you, do, you do need to cross train. And I do have to say for anyone who hasn't been an editor, um, I was on ACRL committees for a while, and I have to say, this is at least like three or four committees. Maybe I was on the slacker committees, I don't know. But this is like, I mean, I feel like I did some pretty good work um, and some pretty hard work, but this is sort of like, um, I don't have any children, but this is sort of like as close as I think I'll have to having a baby. I mean, when the baby cries in the middle of the night and those reviews have to be done, you just have to be there. Um, so if you're thinking about doing this, it is, I think it is a lot of dedication and you should get a lot of good um, promotion and tenure cred for doing this kind of stuff. Um, we also share a belief and a vision and a commitment to open access, so I think that's really important when you start building um, your editorial staff. Um, a sense of humor, um, it can be tough, and I think that's really one of the things that sustains us all, um, and of course with the uh, communications and information literacy. The last um, sort of factor I would say is decency. Um, I, we like to think of ourselves as decent to each other, to our reviewers, to the authors and potential authors, and also to the LIS community. So two desires for the future I would like to share that we have. Um, one is that we are hoping for more cooperative support for open access, and um, Dr. Eve was talking about his Open Humanities project, and I think that's a very good uh, way of sustaining, um, doing some economies of scale. The other thing is that we really hope, or yeah, we really hope that we could mentor new authors. Um, anyone who does, does anyone out there, are you editors on a journal? Just raise your hand. Um, you know, there's only so much time in the day and there's a lot of potential in a lot of those articles that you see, um, but sometimes you really don't have the resources. So if anyone wants to think with me about this, how can we build a support system just like we have reviewers? How could we, oh, and a shout out to Emily. Emily Ford, who's standing by the pole back there, who does, um, this is just a model that I really love, in the library with a lead pipe, um, because they have a very supportive uh, mentoring way of doing their peer review, um, and so maybe I'm gonna be um, knocking on your door, which happens to be right next to my door um, at PSU very soon, but that's one thing I think that we could do a lot more of by trying to train um, new writers in our profession, thanks. The Apple thing on my uh, tag probably tells you I'm having a little bit of trouble with this. Is it here? Mm -hmm. I don't know where they put it. Yeah. Is it just on the right main? Yeah, just click OK here. Um, I think that's, oh, that's here. I don't know. I think that there was a link to it somewhere. Oh, no, my name's wrong. 
Here's in here. Yeah. Thank you so much. Good afternoon. Can you hear me? Yes. Um, my name is Darcy Cullen. I'm an acquiring editor at UBC Press, which is the University of British Columbia Press in Vancouver in Canada. We are a mid-sized press publishing about 60 new titles every year in the social sciences and the humanities. And we publish primarily in history, anthropology, political science, environmental studies, and a core area of ours relates to the project. It's the interdisciplinary field of indigenous or Native American studies. It's a best-selling uh, area for us, attracting readers in both academic and non-academic settings. And we've also had um, a long history of publishing e-books in the various formats starting about 15 years ago. And two years ago, we implemented an XML early workflow, uh, releasing most, if not all, of our books in multiple print and electronic, electronic formats. Uh, so that's just a little bit about myself. And with me today is uh, Alan Bell. Hi. I'm Alan. I'm an Associate University Librarian for Digital Programs and Services at the University of British Columbia. I was responsible for the establishment and continue to spearhead the Scholarly Communication and Copyright Office, which still sorely misses Joy Kirchner. Uh, I was responsible for the opening of our digitization center and establishing our digital preservation program for locally produced and born digital material. And uh, I'm currently working with our central IT, UBC IT, uh, to provide IT services to the library. In past lives, I was a technical manager at uh, High Wire Press at Stanford University Libraries and manager of design and development at Ovid Technologies. To br briefly introduce the UBC Library, we are celebrating our 100th year this year, uh, and the library is the largest library in British Columbia. We are a high-ranking member of the Association of Research Library Libraries, and UBC Library is a development partner with the PKP project. Uh, also important in the context of this talk, uh, we are home to the Waywa Library, the only Aboriginal branch of an academic library in North America that also developed the Brian Deere classification system for indigenous materials. So Darcy and, our, and, and I, uh, well, the press and the, and the library uh, began their collaboration starting in 2008 when the library piloted the, uh, the digital institutional repository that we call CIRCLE. UBC Press joined up and created a book supplement collection where it could house materials that wouldn't make it into the print or the e-book uh, editions. That established a relationship between the library and the press, which eventually led to the conceptualization of the collaborative project uh, currently titled Living Language, Knowing Place. So I'm going to start with just a little bit of context for uh, this project, which is in Indigenous Studies. Uh, it's a project to develop a platform and a collection of digitally enhanced books in Indigenous Studies. And thematically, we're starting with a regional scope focusing on the Pacific Northwest here, where the expertise for this project is, is well developed. And our intention is to design it as a model so that it can be expanded to other contexts and other regions. Um, indigenous Studies has been a key area of publication for UBC Press. We've had a long-standing commitment to publishing works in this area. And it's become increasingly interdisciplinary um, and has wide societal relevance. In Canada, uh, colonial legacy is in the process of being reversed. There was a, an extensive period of cultural and language loss among First Nations. And there are now, there have been major efforts and initiatives underway in linguistic and cultural revitalization. Uh, so this means that there has also been considerable collaborative research, um, and in fact, that's led a decisive change in how this kind of research is undertaken, as First Nations communities themselves are involved with researchers working together to document, to record, conserve, and sustain, importantly, uh, their cultural patrimony. Um, and First Nations are rapidly uh, adopting digital technologies, um, digitizing their audio recordings, creating apps to be able to text in their heritage languages, creating 3D modeling, artifacts, geospatial mapping, interactive teaching tools. So all of this work is underway. And uh, First Nations local cultural practitioners are recognized as experts as opposed to in the past um, as they were presented as interviewees or subjects. Uh, they are now involved in the design and the implementation of research and they're often recognized and have been for some years now as co-authors of book publications in a form of collaborative authorship that's rich in oral history and audiovisual materials. 
So the digital technologies have become essential in these new modes of community-based scholarship. They're facilitating collaborations between these distinct stakeholder groups, and the publishing process and formats have to respond to these changes. So our audience is diverse. It consists of these creator consumers, both academic and non-academic. And so the res research results have to serve multiple purposes in an immediate way. So in our project, we're interested in how digital book publishing can facilitate the exchange and flow of knowledge and materials across these different communities. How these materials and knowledges can be used, shared, reused, and how heritage and scholarship can be brought into new and useful contexts. So with this wealth of audiovisual materials, rich oral histories, holdings that are scattered, which could be brought together, whether it's at the Smithsonian Institution in Washington, the Burke Museum in Seattle, or local heritage centers, there's a pressing need for a different kind of book publishing that's flexible, collaborative, interactive. Um, another very fascinating um, aspect of this area of research is uh, the way in which the open access debate takes on a very different hue. Indigenous peoples have different understandings of intellectual property, of ownership and access. So there are different customary rules that govern the access and of use of songs, crests, objects, images that are quite distinct from conventional or mainstream forms of ownership and licensing. So on one hand, there's this desire to share cultural heritage, to participate in research, and to see this research widely disseminated to a public, uh, a, a wide public. But there's also a long history of colonial appropriation and an alternative approach to sharing, crediting, and accessing materials. So there's a crucial need to ensure that digital research and publication um, respect these cultural protocols. So in this project, we speak instead of respectful access and reciprocal access. Over the last three years, we have expanded our partnership to include museum curators, interaction designers, researchers, specialists in intellectual property issues, in digital resource management, and in participatory mapping. So essentially a collection of interactive, peer-reviewed, digitally enhanced books is what we're trying to create. This morning we heard from a number of people about breathing, life in, uh, breathing new life into texts to allow them to thrive in an online format with connections to primary and secondary uh, sources. This is what we are proposing to do through the digitization projects that libraries and archives are doing, including oral histories, as well as uh, content provided through the re reciprocal research network led through the Museum of Ath Anthropology. This platform needs to be built with the concept of cultural sensitivity and work for First Nations uh, themselves. Uh, we are thinking that this platform would be uh, something that First Nations could be able to use themselves as well, so that their needs are also met by the platform. This must be seen as, re this must be seen as research that is with the First Nations communities and is respectful to their access protocols and traditional knowledge systems as uh, Darcy introduced. The UBC library worked with local Vancouver company called Artifactual to develop our digital preservation cap capabilities for locally produced and born digital materials. Two of our major systems, DSpace and ContentDM, have fully developed digital preservation workflows with Archivematica, and there is a collaborative project in Canada co to also connect Dataverse uh, for research data uh, uh, to the same preservation system, and that's being run out of uh, Scholars Portal in Ontario. So UBC Library is currently doing a track self-audit and then we'll determine this next steps for our digital preservation work after that. However, because the First Nations languages are at such risk, we will privilege appropriate access to materials to ensure that they will be available uh, to the future and then we'll work out how to preserve the content in, the, in a platform as we develop it. Fedora, Hydra, Islandora, Archivematic are all things that are on our radar as we, as we work on this. Finally, we are working with a research center at the UBC Okanagan campus to create an interactive map to aid navigation since place is such an important concept in a project like this. We will use the GeoLive mapping tool to allow participatory, ma participatory mapping uh, as part of this project as well. There is an urgent societal benefit and need for the platform that we are developing. Cultural material, language especially, is a key consideration for indigenous communities who have since the time of contact with Europeans have seen their cultural content stolen, misappropriated, and misrepresented. And we are looking to promote respectful use and sharing of knowledge and cultural heritage material. 
So how are we going to do that? The traditional knowledge licenses uh, that have come out of Makutu, we need to develop a little bit more in the context of other platforms. So our approach is to uh, look at these as microservices that can be system agnostic and allow different platforms or repositories uh, can layer in the concept of cultural sensitivity with some flexibility for themselves as well. Uh, the UBC Library has continued to collect in the area of First Nations materials and archives, including most recently landmark trial archives, and we are developing a library policy aligned with the policy developed at our Museum of Anthropology uh, for cultural sensitivity. And finally, uh, as also mentioned this morning, sustainability is a key consideration of our planning. Archiving a research project through Archive-It as the funding runs out is not an acceptable digital preservation strategy for the project as we have conceived it uh, and have worked with the partners and the communities. In terms of the digitally enhanced books, uh, we've been thinking about this as a way of reframing the book as a hub for multimedia web-based collaborative research. So we maintain that the scholarly book remains a fertile repository of ideas, knowledge, and research. A uh, book of First Nations place names or bilingual traditional stories can capture decades of intergenerational work by a scholar and community members. So this project allows for the scholarly book format to adapt to new and changing needs. It transforms the book from a static and sometimes inaccessible repository to a widely accessible and participatory knowledge hub. So the peer-reviewed text will be layered with source material, new and archival audio and video materials, photographs, written memories, commentary, interview reviews, as well as links to other sites and reciprocal networks, with the book serving always as the organizing principle. We're starting with five pilot books two of which will be based on recent backlist titles, while the others will be born digital. So we'll be addressing the challenge of representing Aboriginal languages in an online environment, including such issues as fonts, browser dependencies, dialect variations. Uh, visualization and annotation tools will be built in, uh, and repurposing will be possible uh, in accordance with these different understandings of uh, ownership and use. Uh, the, the project working groups will be creating the backbone for future projects, establishing a process and creating methods and practices to which new types of inquiry and research can be applied and new additions produced for a growing collection of network books. A platform for interactive exchange. Operate as a network of knowledge materials, improving access to culturally rich and intellectually rigorous content. Participate in the re response to questions related to the use of culturally sensitive materials, indige indigenous intellectual property and heritage protocols in a digital environment, uh, and of course, always raising awareness of appropriate use and sharing of heritage materials, and then supporting enhanced learning opportunities for students, digital heritage cap cap capability building in Aboriginal communities, collaborative research and advancement of uh, emerging Aboriginal scholars. So that's what we're trying to do. Thanks very much. As a, a Mac user as well, I'm just getting to know this particular system. Oops. Uh, save. Is your presentation on the phone? It is. All right, so. It's okay. So I am, my name is Nina Stoyan Rosenzweig, and I'm here from the University of Florida, the Smathers Libraries. Uh, there are two other people who are involved in the, um, presenting this project who are not here. Cecilia Batero, who's the Associate Dean of the Libraries and also Director of the Health Science Center Libraries, which is where I'm located. And then E. Haven Hawley, who's Chair of the Special and Area Studies Collections. Uh, I am located in the Health Science Center Library, where I'm a historian of medicine and archivist. And what we wanted to talk about today 
Our plans that the um, Smathers Libraries in general are developing for a, um, a library press, um, but in some ways maybe reversing what the trend has been and what the discussion has been in these presentations, and that is we're actually kind of working on producing um, print journals or print materials, um, more specifically print books. Um, and uh, the focus of this particular uh, of press has really had to do with our collections at the, the Smathers Libraries. I think um, libraries have become more proactive about their distinctive collections. Certainly the University of Florida libraries have, consciously acquiring materials in new ways and from diverse sources with emerging attention to how unique materials document individual or community experience. So really looking at culture in action, using the collections to illustrate, to preserve that. Um, and this actually supplements traditional work with collectors and vendors. So as the library, especially the UF libraries, are moving out a lot of their print materials, there's actually been more focus on um, particular collections, including physical collections, um, and not necessarily books or journals, but other types of collections. Uh, of course, at the same time, libraries are expanding access through increased publication of original materials available as single images and digital collections of holding placed in specific context through digital humanities portals or content from an institution's own holdings or generated by experts at that institution. So today I'm actually looking at the context in which the libraries are engaging in publishing, um, a few brief examples and a case study of how our institution is moving into the direction of library publishing, um, but I think in some ways challenging maybe common notions about what library publishing is, um, maybe more specifically about who the audience is, although in the case of the most recent presentation, I think they're certainly um, working with and very specific, a very specific audience. Um, so maybe our view of what a library does is a little bit different. Um, one of the projects I'll talk about is a Panama Canal um, project um, where the grant that the University of Florida Libraries receives from IMLS looked at U.S. work in absorbing a community museum and engaging in that community for an ongoing relationship as a model of how libraries can work with two issues, museum artifacts and community. So, um, I'm gonna skip through a number of these slides. A lot of the issues that have come up have already really been discussed. I think David Shear did a great job of kind of talking about the, the benefits and maybe some of the concerns about uh, libraries actually being publishers. Uh, one of the differences and one of the areas in which I would kind of stop at this particular slide is really to talk about how we are focusing on collections, um, the library's holdings, the preeminent collections that the library has, and actually kind of using the book to call attention to the online collections. Um, a brief overview of the UF, um, of UF, it's a land-grant institution with 50,000 students, a wide variety of colleges, academic health center with six health professions colleges. I'm not going to go into all the detail here, but we also have a number of different libraries from the undergraduate library with a lot of humanities holdings, science library, uh, the health science center library, which also has a branch in Jacksonville. UF is located in Gainesville, Florida. Uh, and then also a very large digital collection with millions of images, uh, preeminent collections in Judea Judaica, uh, Latin American Caribbean studies, children's literature, and also the archives at UF, um, both the archives for the university and the Health Science Center are part of the libraries. The overall plan for the, the um, library publishing really is exploring a wide range of, po of possibilities and implementing print publishing projects, but creating a distinctive niche. And the, the particular projects I'll, I'll discuss kind of uh, look at that niche. We have, we've developed our own particular imprint, which you can see um, highlighted here. The library press at UF is what we're calling ourselves. And again, the projects that we're discussing and that ha we have implemented really do highlight the collection's assets. One of these projects looks at the citrus industry, which has become a national symbol of Florida in the eyes of most Americans. Uh, not only is the citrus industry a national symbol of Florida, but 
things associated with that. In particular, labels like these that you see here have provided a compelling landscape, not just for Florida identity, but also for UF uh, identity. A se selection of the labels are available online. There are also reproductions that have been posted in the library in areas where the students study. So they've really kind of come to be identified, not just with Florida itself, but also with University of Florida, and particularly uh, the University of Florida libraries. So this particular collection is going to be used in conjunction with a book arts project. One of our librarians, um, Ellen Knudsen, holds a joint appointment as a faculty member in special and area studies collections department in the libraries, and also in the College of Art and Art History. She works closely with undergraduate students to teach them about book arts. And here in this particular image, you see a class that is really learning how to create their own zines, and then also how to house them in boxes that they also create. Uh, with support from a library fund dedicated to promoting artist books, our award-winning winning faculty member, Ellen Knudsen, has established a residency to create a Library Press of Florida artist book. It'll start with a national competition for the residency, bringing in an emerging book artist to Gainesville this summer to work under her guidance. She and this uh, resident will then dive into the citrus labels and Florida history collections with support from subject experts. And they will create a special publication, a series of art objects inspired by the holdings in special collections that have captivated the campus. Um, these will be produced as prints. They will become guest souvenirs for an upcoming agricultural library and conference hosted by UF and for other promotions. Uh, and in this case, audiences will stretch from judges at juried artist book uh, competitions to potential donors, to conference attendees, to Artbound, the library's annual book arts exhibition. And one copy will go in our collections. Another project that has resulted in, um, in the production of a print um, book, if you will, has to do with what I mentioned earlier, and that is the Panama Canal. So while the book arts uh, works with a community of undergraduates in particular, but also a community of book artists and others who will be engaged in that particular project, um, in this case, uh, this particular community that was really being addressed with the Panama Canal project uh, was with a publication that the libraries produced for the centennial was actually uh, Zonians, a uh, community of people, um, Americans who lived in the canal, um, who produced, actually created a museum with more than 16,000 objects, photographs, works of art, newspapers, books and ephemera telling the story of people who, were, who lived and worked in the canal zone, of Americans who were in the canal zone. Um, when the museum itself um, closed, the UF libraries actually absorbed that collection and produced a comprehensive program of events for the centennial. And you can see illustrated here some of the materials in the collection, but also some of the events that took place in August of 2014, um, covering all aspects of life in the canal zone, the engineering feat, medical advances, uh, recruitment of the international workforce, daily life in indigenous art, uh, all of these things were uh, highlighted during the celebration, which included exhibitions in libraries around campus, lectures and craft activities, chamber orchestra concert, and Panamanian dances in a week of festivities. Of course, also developed was a book-like object, uh, which was evidence of permanence for the Zonian community, um, kind of like a Jubilee um, album and gathered essays on all major aspects of life in the canal zone. The libraries themselves coordinated content written by experts, not necessarily peer reviewed, but experts were selected to do the writing. And most of them actually came from the University of Florida. So a variety of topics, you can see just that there's a very wide range of topics that were covered in this particular um, press or this particular book, which also was available, again, as something solid for the Zonians to share with children and grandchildren, but also a digital book that could be available through a simple internet link. So again, publishing an object that then links back to a collection that's online. 
Uh, the case study that I am also talking about today, this is the one in which I'm involved as the archivist for the Health Science Center, is a history, College of Medicine history book. The UF College of Medicine was opened in 1956, at least open for students. Uh, the 60th anniversary will be coming up in 2016, and the dean chose to capture the history using objects, materials from the, the archives in the Health Science Center. And just obviously, I don't think you can see uh, the, the type here, but this is a brochure that talks about how much it costs for course fees for medical school in 1956. It was $225 per semester quite different from today, um, oops. but um, the, this book was actually made possible because the College of Medicine, the Health Science Center did actually hire me in 2011 to create the archives and to collect these historical materials. In the process, I digitized a photograph collection and also added to the oral history program that was started um, by a historian at UF and includes a collection of oral history interviews from a variety of different groups, but in particular, the Health Science Center has been a focus. When I started, I continu continued the oral history program. We also, um, since the Health Science Center is st so young, we actually also have, it's kind of a living history, and we have an early scholarly history that captures firsthand um, uh, accounts. So again, it's a special history because it's still kind of a living history, but it's also um, special in the sense that there are aspects of the history that are unique. The founding dean was the only person to found two medical schools. He went on to found the College of Medicine at Hershey, um, Penn State. And again, it's enhanced by specific and unusual aspects of the collection. So the book itself is being created through the library press. The H Health Center Library's director, Cecilia Botero, dean of the College of Medicine, myself, are, have been working on the book. It's not peer-reviewed, so it's not in competition with the UF press, but it is public or printed through the UF Press under the library imprint, a contracted author, um, documented material but no footnotes, many images from the collection, and it's reviewed through an editorial board, not necessarily peer review, um, and the goal is to reach the medical school community. So really, at UF at least, uh, the, the focus is to collaborate with the University of Florida Press when possible for printing, when it's a particularly a, a type of document that focuses on our collections and communities, centers and areas of excellence, with our own kind of scholarly, scholarly and juried process, not necessarily focusing on peer review, um, but really focusing on maintaining high academic standards, um, but maybe kind of creating a different paradigm for understanding that by incorporating juried um, uh, books from the artist community, as well as just other ways of kind of looking at producing scholarly works. All right, thank you.